Our next speaker, uh, when I first saw, um, when I first met her actually at a Gulliver Prep Engineering uh, conference, I was completely blown away by uh, what, she, what she's gone through and kind of uh, where she's taking it. Uh, our next speaker, Alessandra Maggioni, she's 15, Gulliver. Can come up. <laughs> And on even, I don't even want to spoil anything, it's just an unbelievable story. Without further ado, Alessandra. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alessandra Maggioni, and I'm 15 years old. And what I'm here to do tonight is very simple. I'm just here to tell you my story in the most open-hearted and humbling way that I possibly can. So without further ado, this is my story. I started playing tennis at the age of four, and I loved tennis. Tennis was my dream. Ever since I could remember, if someone would ask me, Ale, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would always answer that my plan was to become a professional tennis player. That being said, all my birthday candle wishes that we all know, and the New Year's Eve wishes, they were all expressed in the hope of trying to reach my dream. But then at 10 years old, I reached the first unexpected bump in the road to trying to reach my dream. And that was when I was diagnosed with scoliosis. Scoliosis is an abnormal curvature of the spine in a C or S form. Therefore, I was braced for 20 out of the 24 hours per day. Put into the perspective, that's a lot of time. So just take a moment and imagine what it would feel like to have this big bulky thing on you pressing on your sides for 20 out of the 24 hours per day. That's what I had to go through. And so being that it was very uncomfortable, I also realized that I was different. And I didn't realize that only by myself, but because people at school started making fun of me. I never went to school looking good. I always had shirts triple my size and pants triple my size, which because the brace made me so huge. And then I couldn't tuck my shirt in and I couldn't wear a belt, so I couldn't comply to the dress code that the school provided because it would interfere with the brace. So this created so many insecurities for me, but thankfully I had tennis, because as soon as I would step my foot on that tennis court, all of these worries and anxieties, they would all fade away, because being good at tennis overpowered these problems that I had at school. So I realized this today, that being different is good, and being different is okay, but back then, being different was a torture. So then, two and a half years later, I finally received the amazing news that my back had stabilized. These were the words that I had wanted to hear for the past two and a half years. And so that time, I was able to take my brace off and live on a normal life without the brace. This made me the happiest girl in the world. And to give you kind of a perspective, the first thing I did when they removed my brace, I went to Target and I bought a pajama. Because, <laughs> because I finally didn't have to sleep with this big, bulky brace, and I could sleep with a cute, girly pajama. And then right after Target, we ran to the uniform store to buy shirts my size and pants my size. Because the next day, I could return to school and tuck my shirt in and be like every other kid at that school. So after, oops, sorry, this was my brace. So um, after, I also played tennis very vigorously because it was the thing that I loved most to do in the world and I could do it without any restrictions. And so, but playing very vigorously, I forgot about the health of my back. But then I would be reminded of it in two ways. First of all, with this bump. Each time I would attempt to try and wear something tight fitting, kind of like the dress I have today, I would have to remove it because this big bump, which is my rib cage that had twisted due to the curvature, would pop out. And it would make me look more deformed than what I already was. And secondly, the pain. The pain had gotten unbearable to the point where I couldn't walk and I had trouble carrying out my daily life activities. So then I never really expressed this pain either to my parents or to my coaches because I was terrified that they would take tennis away. And this was something that my father was insisting on every single day. So today I remember it was a constant battle between my parents and I due to tennis and the back and all of its consequences. So each time I would see my parents' facial expression when they saw this bump, I knew that when I would return to the doctor in the near future, I would leave very unhappy, and so I did. 
Over the next eight months, I saw the progression of my disease, and I saw this bump just grow and grow like an un unstoppable alien. And then when I walked into that office, I had my heart beating extremely fast, and I did an x-ray and I waited for the doctor. And when he came in, he said very few cold words. And today, the only thing I remember is the word surgery. is the word surgery, and I needed, I needed immediate surgery before the end of the year. So then I did the surgery, that was September 10th, and this happened November 18th, 2013. I think the picture does it justice, but this spinal fusion surgery is one of the most invasive surgeries on the medical field. As you can see, it requires the breakage of all of the vertebrae, the removal of hard and soft tissue, the tearment of all the muscle, to then begin placing these rods and screws. Inside of me right now, I have two rods, two metal rods and 26 screws which are holding my spine aligned. And the breakage of five ribs which are used to create bone graft and allograft which hold the spine together. So after I did this big stepping stone of surgery, I was left to face the year-long recovery, which in my opinion, it is much harder to go through the recovery than the surgery itself. Um, the year-long recovery, it's usually a year, and today, standing in front of all of you sharing my story, I am at 17 months of recovery, and I'm very proud to say that I'm happy, healthy, and blessed to be here with a straight spine. So, this year-long of recovery, I went home, and I started facing all of these restrictions that the surgeon gave me, and I didn't feel normal. So I coped with this by creating small goals to try and reach normality again. So even though, regardless of the fact that inside of myself, I felt like a failure, and I knew that normality wasn't something I could achieve, I kept moving forward. And after these goals, I created other small goals, to, all based on that one day where I would finally return to the tennis court. So at my six-month follow-up after the surgery, the doctor finally told me that I could play tennis again. These were the most beautiful words I had ever heard that time, and I had him repeat it to my mom and I 10 times because we both were in shock and couldn't believe what he was saying. So that day, I went home. Oop, this is my scar. Um, I went home. I took out all of my tennis uniforms. I took out my tennis racket, my tennis bag, and I regripped everything in preparation for the next day where I would finally return to the tennis court and answer this agonizing question that I had been asking myself for the past six months. Would I ever be able to return to play tennis? And that day when I returned to the tennis court, I learned what failure really is, what incapacity feels like, and what sadness and depression really do. That was the day that I learned that I would never be able to play tennis again. So although at that moment I felt like I was dying inside and I had another eight months of depression to follow, I started to move forward because I had to stop looking at everything that I had suffered and start focusing on the positive perspective of this situation. So a sneak peek of what I learned is the following. I learned that nothing in life, no matter how big or dangerous, is too big for me to overcome because it doesn't depend on the situation. It depends on me, on my willpower, on my determination, on my courage. That's what's going to bring me through the situation, not the situation itself. And I learned to give certain things in life the importance they need because at that time, tennis was not the most important thing. The most important thing was me trying to reach healthiness again. And I also learned that resorting to excuses and denial, which is normal when we're faced with a tough situation, is a waste of time. Because excuses and denial just act as a band-aid on what we don't want to face. So the amount of times that I sat on the floor of my bathroom and I asked myself, why? Why does this happen to me? What did I do wrong to receive this as a consequence are infinite. But I realized that asking myself these questions accomplishes absolutely nothing for the simple reason that I do not have an answer. To this day, I don't have an answer of why it happened. It just did. But me sitting on that floor and asking myself these questions doesn't take me anywhere. So from that, I learned that if I were to actually get up from that floor and do something about what I wanted to conquer, then I would have been successful. Because I learned to take a step. Because even the tiniest step 
could have turned into the biggest step that I had ever taken. And lastly, I learned that failure is the best thing that has ever happened to me. To this day, I strongly believe that. And although it may seem very contradictory, I'll explain to you why, and it's very simple. I think we can all agree that no one wants to fail at anything, correct? Everything, everyone wants to be great at this and great at that and great at everything, so failure is not an option. But what I've learned is that failure is okay. Because if you never fail at anything and you're great at everything, that just lets your insecurity grow. Instead, if you fail every now and again, then you'll become wise, you will grow, but most of all, your determination will grow until you succeed. So no matter how many times you will reject failure in your life, know that when you reject failure, you are denying yourself the opportunity of learning better. Because failure is education. So failure is an opportunity to succeed. I am very proud of my fighting and my determination. Because of them, I was able to walk right after surgery, swim at three months post-op, jog at six months post-op, and what today, at 17 months of recovery, are slowly starting to put me back on the tennis court to do what I love to do most, and that's play tennis. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if my dream of becoming a professional tennis player will become reality. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know, but for sure I will try. But what I do know is that I achieved a different dream. The dream of becoming strong, secure, determined, and realizing that nothing in life can beat me. But the greatest and most beautiful gift that I have ever received is the art of learning how to help others and doing so. Over the first six months of my recovery, the only thing that was giving me strength was thinking about my summer that in those three months of summer, I would go to the IMG Academy and do a full immersion in tennis and just play and play and play to gain back everything that I had lost in this past year. But instead, I did something completely different. The first day out of school, I went to my surgeon's window and I knocked on his office window and I asked him if I could please do an internship with him. And I was blessed with his answer when he said yes. So the first couple of days, I gained up all the courage that I could find inside of my body, and I went to see my surgery live. I saw what happened to me right in front of my eyes. And let me tell you, what they do to us is horrible. They open us up like chickens, and the drilling and the screwing and the breaking, it's just a terrible sight to look at. But at the same time, what they do is so magnificent. Because thanks to them and to their expertise, I am here today and I am able to move my arms and my legs and do whatever I would like. So after seeing a couple of these surgeries, I had the blessing to go and do rounds with him and see patients with him. And when he would disclose it to the patients that they needed surgery, they were then left with me. And they would come up to me and ask me, what do I have to expect pre-op? What do I expect post-op? How does it feel? What do you feel when you wake up? What do you feel today? And I had the blessing to tell them what to expect before and after and to give them the confidence that everything was going to be okay. And then the most beautiful part was when the parents came up to me and the parents saw me as a living proof of what was going to their happen to their kids very soon. So even the parents would ask me, how does it feel like when you go home? What does it feel like when you get up for the first time? Can I see your back? Can I touch your back? So me answering all of their questions and giving them, giving them the strength that their child was going to be okay gave them the confidence to help their child. And in, during this internship, I learned that I am not the only one that has gone through this. There are so many kids on a yearly basis that undergo spinal fusion surgery. In the United States alone, each year 38,000 kids undergo spinal fusion surgery. And the kids that have gone through the surgery know exactly what I'm up about to say next. The pain that we are left with after the surgery is excruciating. Today, at 17 months of recovery, there is not a day that goes by that I don't have pain, that I don't think of my surgery because of the pain. So in October, when I was at 10 months of recovery, this pushed me of a way to think in which I could help these kids. And that's when I took advantage of the blessing that I had to be part of the engineering program at Gulliver Preparatory, and I created a device called Got Your Back. 
in a nutshell, what Got Your Back is all about is an ultra thin vest that you can wear under your clothes so no one knows that you're wearing it. And it has protective and heating capacities. The protective capacities, which are made out of bulletproof material, not that we're gonna get bullets, but it does the same thing of um, diffusing an impact to the spine. The reason is because if an impact is put on the spine, then it imposes a danger on the in-place hardware that they may pop out and further complications arise. So after the protective capacities, there's the heating capacities because anyone can be at home with a plugged in heat pad. I do it all the time because it alleviates my pain, but it is very hard to have relief on the go. So that's when we created an ultra thin wireless heat pad that you can put together with the protective capacities. So the heating and the protective capacities come together to form a very thin ultra vest targeted specifically towards scoliosis patients that will help not only myself, but most importantly, every other kid that has gone through this surgery. So in conclusion, what I've learned throughout this entire journey is that the blessing and the joy and happiness that you receive when you help someone else is much more rewarding than winning a tennis tournament any day. So I thank you for your time and I thank you for your attention and listening to my story.